verses from Exodus chapter 24. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commands I have written for their instructions. So Moses set out with Joshua and his aid, and Moses went up on the mountain of God. He said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and Hur are with you. Anyone involved in a dispute can go to them. When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as it went on up the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain for forty days and forty nights. And as he came down, his face glowed. Remember in the scriptures, his face glowed, and he actually had to wear a veil because it hurt the people's eyes to even look at him because he had his face shown. But we'll refer back to that in just a moment. First, I'd like to talk just a little bit about a particular movie that came out in 1985. It was called Cocoons. I don't know if anybody saw this. It did have some major people starring in this movie, but the storyline was simple. It went something like this. The aliens returned to Earth to retrieve some of their friends who were encased in cocoons beneath the ocean. It's obviously science fiction. So the aliens came to get the people who were in cocoons beneath the ocean. The aliens made the mistake of temporarily stashing some of their cocoon friends in a swimming pool. Well, these, it was at a retirement home. So you can imagine what happened. Some of the elderly people came out to swim in the pool. Now, they saw the cocoons in the pool, but they didn't really care, so they just swam anyway. But when they got out of the water, they were real young. They had become really young, and they were all revived, and they were all excited because they now were young again. So, as the story goes on, the aliens invite the elderly people to come up to their planet where they will have immortality. They will be young forever. So the, the interesting part of the movie as it progresses is this whole question, this whole question of if I have the opportunity to be young and immortal forever, Am I willing to leave my friends and my family to go do this? Because they had to leave their loved ones behind. So there was a real struggle in their lives, in many of their lives, trying to figure out, do I stay with my family and my friends? Do I stay here on Earth? Or do I go on along in this spaceship where I can be young and have the mortality of a young life? Now, part of the movie was that this one alien unzipped her diver suit and her skin also unzipped, and there was this light. There was this light. So, yes, it's kind of a weird movie, and I'm not going to talk about it anymore, but it gets us into that whole question of experiencing immortality. We are given the hope through Jesus Christ that we as Christians and children of God can have hope of spending eternity in heaven. We don't need the aliens. We don't need the cocoons. We don't need the swimming pools and all of that nonsense. We don't need any of that to, in order to have our life with Christ. Well, today we experience and we celebrate Transfiguration Sunday. <laughs> Today we experience and we celebrate transfiguration. And we see a time when Jesus went up on the mountain with Peter, James, and John, and we get a picture, again, of a blazing light. We get a picture of Jesus as he is transfigured up on the mountain. And we hear and we heard the scripture of Moses as he had gone up on the mountain, and his face shone because he was transfigured, so to speak, with the light of God shining through him. Now these are real stories. This is the real story 
of Jesus and his life and how he is the son of God. And it's not a story of aliens and it's not a story of false light or silly stuff like that. This is the real thing. This is not science fiction where Jesus went up on the mountain and he was transfigured and he shone. He shone with the glory of God. We see stories of light from the beginning of creation up through time. We see God says, let there be light. And there was light the very first day. We see God appearing to Moses in the burning bush. Again, these are not science fiction events. These are real things where God appeared to Moses in a burning bush. And God says, it's holy ground. We see that God carried the nation of Israel through the wilderness as a cloud by day and a fire by night. These were real things that happened. They don't seem like they would be normal events we're used to, but this was God's presence in the life of the Hebrew people as they went through the wilderness. The story of God validating the tabernacle, the temple, where he rested his Shekinah glory, the luminous, awesome, visible glory that is God's, was over these structures. The story of God responding to Elijah's call for consuming fire on the altar. And I've told this story many times in different places and times. I love this story of how God calls upon the fire and all the prophets of Baal, they couldn't do a thing. They couldn't cause anything to happen. But when Elijah called on God, the fire of God came down into the altar. It burned up everything. <coughs> In the water around it, we saw the consuming fire of God. The story of Elijah being taken in the chariot of fire into heaven. Again, this is not science fiction. This is not aliens didn't come to get Elijah to pick him up and take him away. This is the real thing where Elijah is taken by a chariot of fire into heaven. The story of the angels who appear in blazing light to the shepherds who were sore afraid as they saw the magnificence and the glory of the angels appear to the shepherds to tell them of the birth of Christ. The story John tells of the light which came into the world who lights all who are in the world, the light of Christ. The story of Paul being blinded by the light of God until his eyes are opened to the truth of God. The story of the holy city, the new Jerusalem, and of God as the light of the city where there is no need of the sun by day or the moon by night, for God is its light. Peter, James, and John have accompanied Jesus up the mountain where something wonderfully miraculous happens. And as they watch, Jesus is transfigured. He is changed into something that they have never seen before. Into a glowing, radiant light. He shone. And if that weren't enough, Moses and Elijah appear alongside Jesus and talk with him about the future. These are real events. Moses is glowing. Elijah is glowing. Jesus is glowing. Radiantly white pouring light from their clothes, their faces, their hands, their arms, light floods from all around them, and God speaks. And this is so awesome because he says the words that he says at Jesus' baptism. He says, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. This is my son. Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. All who have seen the glory of God face to face. Moses and Elijah both were called friends of God. Moses was the lawgiver who ascends Mount Sinai to receive the, God, the law from God. We just heard that scripture where Moses went up onto Mount Sinai. The law that will distinguish God's people from all other people on the earth. Moses has stood in the presence of God closer than any other person ever stood. So close that his own face glowed with radiant light. Then we hear of Elijah. Elijah the prophet in our scripture today was about Elijah. 
and how he was a prophet of God and he was representing all the prophets of God. Elijah, who has seen God's provision for a widow and her son and God's judgment on a king and a kingdom that worshipped false gods. God brought judgment onto the kingdom as they worshipped false gods. The gods of Baal, the false gods. We are called to turn away from any false gods and to believe only in our God. Elijah is so profoundly in tune with God that God sends a chariot of fire, pulled by horses of flame, to carry Elijah in a whirlwind to heaven. Again, this is not stories of aliens, and this is not stories of science fiction. This is real stories of God and his work as he has done down through time, down through the thousands of years. Jesus himself, who stepped out of the throne room of heaven, and he came down to earth and he gave up his position of glory in heaven for a time to be here and to walk among us and to be totally human and yet fully divine, dependent upon Mary, his mother, as an infant, being born in a very humble beginning of a stable and being willing to experience everything that we experience so that he can be our savior and he can be our God and he knows what we go through, what we feel, what we experience. He knows the temptation we live under because he spent 40 days and 40 nights in temptation, experiencing all of that so that he can relate to us and know where we are and how he can love us and be with us. And from that time on, Peter, James, and John were not the same. I mean, can you imagine being on the mountain and experiencing this with Christ? Just the day before, Jesus had said to the disciples, who do you say that I am? And the disciples had said, well, some people say you're Elijah. Some people say you're John the Baptist. Some people say you're a prophet. A prophet. And Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are Christ. You are the Son of God. And it's almost as if God is answering that question for us because Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on the mountain and they're up there and they experience this and God says, this is my son. This is my beloved son. And Peter, James, and John would never be the same again. They would continue to have a, a different understanding. They're certainly not perfect, but changed. When we experience God in our lives, when we experience Jesus Christ in his glory on the cross, his bloodshed, when we experience Jesus Christ and know him in our heart, we are never the same. We are changed. We are transformed. We're not perfect, but we are changed. We are transformed. There they were on the mountain, experiencing something about Jesus that they had not really fully known or understood. They had seen him do healings. They had seen him do miracles. But now they see the transfigured Jesus Christ as truly the Son of God. And it changed their lives. God's glory changes us changes us. It changes us. He transforms us. It changed Moses on Mount Sinai. It changed Elijah at Mount Carmel. It changed Peter, James, and John on Mount Tab Tabor. And no, we can't build tabernacles and stay on that mountain. But sometimes when we can experience Christ in our hearts, His forgiveness, His mercy, His love, His healing grace, his empowerment through the Holy Spirit, His work in us, we change, and we keep changing, and we keep transforming, and that God desires for us to become more Christ-like, to change, to repent, to know how to live, and to be what God would have us to be, to hear His voice, to walk in His ways, to follow Him in all things, to turn away from false gods, 
turn away from the things, the veils of this world that we have, these things that are so tempting and pull us in all directions. We are called to serve God, to experience God, to experience His Son, Jesus Christ, in a way that changes our hearts and draws us to Him and makes us new, renewed, and strengthened. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus, our Lord.